actually. You're giving him a thumbs up. You gonna give him a thumbs up? Good. Okay, okay. it's working. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to call to order the work session of the Larimer County Board of Commissioners. Today is our usual Monday afternoon work session with our uh, Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources uh, Division. I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm the Chairman of the Board of Commissioners this year, joined by John Cavallis, Commissioner from District 1, Steve Johnson, Commissioner from District 2, and Leslie Ellis, our Community Development Director, is here with us. Yes. Is that your title? Yes. Okay, and you're going to introduce a couple items, I think? I'll kick us off. So okay. Leslie Ellis, Community Development Director, as you noted. And um, we've got five items on the agenda today, and we'll start with Tony Brooks from um, our Code Compliance Division. Good morning, Commissioners. So I have a request from the Community Development staff to um, authorize legal action against the property located at 441 West County Road 16 in Loveland. The property owner is um, allowing people to occupy sheds, multiple sheds on the property, and then a garage may have, may, be convert, may have been converted to a dwelling per one of the occupants of the sheds. What's the address? It's 441 West County Road 16. I've gone, I've sent, I've put, posted this structures with notices and he did respond he, he called me left a message told me who he was and why this guy's out here he was a friend or something I told him that it was unsafe and it's not sanitary um, it's unclear where the human waste is going on the property I think it's dumping into one of the ponds I have photographs that you guys can make a look at good Samaritan um, and I've sent 15 a 15 day letter and a 30 day letter and nobody's responded to the letters and before someone gets hurt or killed out there you should probably so is this the same one that we had a few years ago where the guy with the where the guy had the street sweeping operation remember that no, one Karn? that's down yeah. the, that's over on Campbell that's Street really close by right yeah oh yeah that's like John house. wants everyone to live yeah. in those this is on like just a block north of this property this is block north of where we had that or yeah of okay. this long how did you get here. pictures inside the guy let me in oh, he, okay. he gave me the grand tour the, the wow. occupant maybe he thought you needed a rent place or something yeah. <laughs> he wants you to be his roommate get some it's, bunk beds they had like a toilet in there and a sink it looks like it's got a porta potty didn't he there was actually a frog that was still that's alive a real frog? yeah that's a no you got a good picture yeah i saw him sitting there i'm like is I he living off of the I human waste that thing in my fountain that looks just like that. yeah he's growing up <laughs> he's growing up fifth leg there because he's bathing in so sewage all the time huh. probably so you put your little red tag on there okay so the card Tony is that your truck so we're just so How many I, are there living in here there's multiple little houses in yeah I, he let me in all the sheds and I saw a little toilet and a sink the owner did this mm -hmm. he didn't realize it was illegal or he he's just, just making extra money so okay. he's just getting rent money so yeah. So I guess the question is, we would like to bring this to Admin Matters next Tuesday. What are these like tough sheds, or are these actual stick some, built? Or? Yeah, some of them are look like little homemade sheds. Uh, no building, no building uh, inspections no on any of them. Yeah. He does have an expired building permit for an addition to the main residence. Yeah, that's an O5 permit. Okay. Okay. I'm good. What's the property owner's name in case he calls me? <laughs> Joe Mestis. Okay, I think maybe um, I've heard from him. Let's see. Okay, and Lucy, Joe and Lucy Mestis. <clears throat> What's the thing next to them? That looks like a junkyard. He owns another property. There's two properties to the west, which looks like they're operating a oh, RV and boat storage. But we didn't get a complaint, and they're both illegal. But we're not dealing with those at the moment. <laughs> I can go on the, the whole every I can. why was this this structure that looks better than the ones that are in pretty bad shape why was that notice put on there why is it unsafe to occupy besides they haven't done any of the building permits or anything like that is that the reason okay. yeah because there's no building permit for it we don't know there's but no it wasn't just things. that one it was all of them there was a bunch of them there was at least three that I saw it's halfway decent at least from the outside yeah it's tiny it's about eight by ten it's they're really small they have a toilet and a shower one of the photos shows a toilet and I think a shower or a sink next to it, I forget. And where's that toilet going to drain into? Exactly. I think it goes to that pond. But. Ooh. Back in the old Nobody. days in Kansas, man. Yeah. 
about today in Kansas. What do you mean? Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit rough over there. Gross. So he's just not responding. I've, you know, posted the property, sent him letters, no response, and he's just getting, there's no voicemail. It's full. Somebody come into admin to ask to remove the structures? To ask for legal action. Okay. So. And I'll support that. How many structures are there, Tony? There was at least three that I saw, and then the occupant of one of the sheds said that there's people living in the two gar garages, so five plus the dwelling, so six. The garages have building permits? Not to be finished, obviously. Is right, I think they, were, they might be grandfathered, but they are now converted into habitable space or dwellings. Hmm. <laughs> and Colorado Social Services has called me to see what the options are for those people. I told them that there is really not much, there's not many options. And so there are children involved? No, I didn't see any children, but just the people there that can't, they don't have any place to go. And it's like, well, he could, someone could suffocate and die. There's no smoke and CO detectors. There's no. And the people who have been occupying these homes or these sheds, they've been paying rent? That's what they were telling me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, cool, thank you. All right, work. Go. So, um, Mark Peterson will cover the next two items on our agenda, the Country Club Road truck restriction and the Poudre River floodplain um, cotton willow item. Oh, cotton willow. Back. That's in LaPorte, right? It's con is that the subdivision in LaPorte? Oh, yeah. With your buddy uh, Greenwald or whatever his name is. Oh, yeah. I get the key to that. Yeah. Looks like the back of a Schwab's truck or something. Yeah, man. That probably, oh, yeah, it's the bed. You got people it's living in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark Peterson, County Engineer. So, the first thing we're going to talk to you about is Country Club Road. And as you'll recall, um, due to the fact that we had Al Canyon Road closed for construction up north, as well as ongoing construction uh, with the CDOT project to uh, widen 287. <clears throat> pretty much west of State Highway 1, we had come to you and uh, the decision was made to put in a temporary length restriction on Country Club Road between Turnberry and State Highway 1. So pretty much covering this two-mile segment here. The, the turn at this corner, which is the entrance to the Country Club and the golf course, is pretty restricted in terms of turning movements, and that was what led to the 45-foot truck length restriction that was put in place. And, you know, it's been there for a number of months now, but those construction projects have now largely been completed. And so um, we, we sort of wanted to give you feedback that we've heard from the residents out there. Um, we've, we have collected some data on what difference um, those truck restrictions made in terms of usage of that roadway. It is seeing, you know, increases in, in the overall traffic volume. We've had the, you know, the development that's occurred in the city of Fort Collins, east of Turnberry. Um, you know, there really just aren't too many east-west routes out in this area. You really have Douglas Road up here at the north, Country Club in between, or you've got to then go out of direction travel south to get the Timberline and Vine. The city's transportation master plan is looking at getting Turnberry extended here and they're also building out Senega, which is a parallel. It'll sort of be the new Vine Drive in terms of an ar arterial roadway connection down in this part of town. But until then, we have a lot of traffic on Country Club. Most people that are live in this area that have kids in elementary school go to Tavelli. So they're gonna go down to Valley to LeMay. We see a lot of probably just commuter traffic coming up LeMay, uh, peak hour right turns eastbound in the evening are, are high. Uh, commence early, we've got a fair number of traffic westbound on Country Club, actually higher volumes, I believe, of, of westbound traffic 
during the peak hour in the morning. And then it is obviously a connection over to US or State Highway 1 and it's not much to get down to 287 if somebody's trying to go off in that direction. Part of it's probably coming about because Google and some of the navigation apps, depending on where you are when you you put in your origin and destination, they're going to pick Country Club as being a, a shorter route. Um, so some of the data we had before the truck restrictions went into place indicated that we had close to 100, just under 100. Just under 100 semis. 100 semi trucks. So we're not talking just trucks in general. We're talking semi tractor trailer units. So just under 100. After the truck restrictions, when we went out and did what well, we did, camera counts, where we had cameras out, collected data, um, and and took counts off that data as well as the classifiers were out there, and we were down to about just under 30, right? 28. Right at 30. Yeah. 30 trucks. 30 semi trucks, -trucks per day. So we didn't we didn't totally eliminate them. There's still trucks that are utilizing that road, and I know the sheriff went out there and responded and tried to do some enforcement, but we still have trucks that choose to ignore, you know, that, that restriction and drive that route. Now, certainly there are some instances where there are local deliveries. You know, we know that the country club itself gets deliveries from, you know, tractor trailer rig. So, you know, there need to be exceptions for that kind of, of delivery, but mm -hmm. that's kind of where we stand. Um, the residents will still, We've had conversations with them as recently as last week, and there's still residents out there that will tell you, you know, there's still lots of trucks. They're coming through at night. Um, you know, so, it hasn't been fully effective. But. So just by, for, by means of comparison, have you done um, a truck study on, I mentioned I live on, my house backs up to Wilson Avenue in Loveland, County Road 19. Have you done a truck count on the north end of County, of County Road 19 at maybe 57th in, in Loveland? I don't believe we for have comp, for comp just Not to reason. compare. No, no, I don't. I mean, are there more than thirty trucks there? My guess is there's way more than that. Yeah. There is. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, you know, truck traffic normally is. City. Yeah. On arterial roads. Now, the only difference about Country Club is that right now it's so Douglas Road up here has an arterial classification. Vine is obviously an arterial. Yeah. Country Club right now is classified as a minor collector. Now, arguably, it perhaps ought to be, it's probably underclassified in a sense based on the connectivity that it right. provides. It would be, it would be classified higher based on connectivity, but it's probably classed appropriately based on the kind of the geometry, I suppose. Sort of. I mean, we have a lot of residential accesses along that road. When you um, get those curves. And, and weird. the geometry, just getting around the lake. We don't have, the road is fairly narrow. We don't have much room along the lake, you know, the road is pretty close to the lakeside. Um, so part of the question, I guess, is to come back to you and just ask you, is this something you want us to pursue in terms of a more permanent restriction? Certainly the residents out there are interested from what we're hearing, from those we're hearing from, are interested in that kind of thing. Um, if we were to go with any kind of permanent restriction, we would recommend it only be applicable to semi trucks. So it would be a semi truck restriction. As opposed to what? Well, if you just say no trucks, a truck could encompass, you know, a, a FedEx, you know, delivery truck. Oh. That Mark, do that. it's two axles. Would that be similar signage, for example, what we have just north of the intersection of um, Country Club Road and LeMay on Gregory, where it's there are no, no, what does that say? No trucks. Gregory says no trucks. But and we're talking about long haul trucks, the, the, the bigger ones. Semi tractor trailer. It's a, a combination truck of uh, a semi tractor and a separate which, trailer. Which is what the residents would like to see happen. Those are, you know, generally long haul trucks. I mean, you can see some that are making, you know, that are working through the area, but. Mark and colleagues, what, what are the implications in terms of uh, truck traffic and all the other traffic that's happening up there for all the reasons. If we were to prohibit um, the long haul trucks from traveling Country Club Road based on the fact that it's a minor collector street, what are the implications of that as far as Douglas, as far as you know, going north, as far as 
cutting across the fields, <laughs> you know, whatever. Well, I mean, you may see some increase on truck traffic. I mean, if trucks are currently taking that route, they're going to want to find an alternate route. Um, if they're through trucks, you know, our preference, generally speaking, would be that they stay on the state highway or the, you know, U.S. highway system. Um, but otherwise, if we're talking about truck movement, you know, they can utilize the arterial roadways. So you may see some go to up, up north to Douglas. That traffic may increase. As well, when we signalize that intersection um, next year, I believe traffic volumes will increase on that road just because they'll have a, a better route to, to travel across without dealing with a, an unsignalized intersection where you're having to wait to try to make a safe access, uh, you know, turn onto State Highway 1. If I may, Mark, remind me again, what are the challenges with um, changing the app or the GPS system that says this is a preferred route? Well, so, I mean, Bill has made, con yeah, maybe you ought to just speak rather than me. Yeah, Bill, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. Bill Gleeforce, Traffic Operations Manager. We have made requests to the GPS folks to indicate that that road is not open to truck traffic, and it hasn't been implemented yet. To, you know, we just don't have control over what they put out. But I think if we put in a permanent uh, resolution or, or ordinance, then we may be able to eventually get that on there as, yes, this road is closed to semi-trucks. And at least for now, Al Canyon Road is open. Yes. That should relieve some of the pre the pressure, but ultimately, once we go to the next phase, then that that a se another section of the road will be closed. Isn't isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, anytime we do construction, there are there are somewhat temporary impacts on the road network. You know, Vine, the overpass has been closed, so we've seen increased traffic. You know, as people make their way around that construction on I-25. So we always have temporary or short-term construction impacts. This is getting at, you know, whether or not you want to take the step to restrict semi-truck traffic on Country Club on a more permanent basis. So I'm grateful for your due diligence, and I know I've worked on this issue since I've basically come into office, and it's a big concern. I think it's a pretty serious public safety issue, so you probably know what my recommendation is. The other thing I should mention is that we actually, we, we did meet with the county attorney's office last week, and they basically said, you know, based on looking at state statute, we really don't have a good legal standing to restrict, to make a permanent restriction based on length. That's right. And so it, it should be either based on weight or vehicle type. And as we look at this road, we don't see a, a basis really for restricting on the basis of weight. And that's why we would be recommending that it's vehicle type, it's semi-trucks that generally are the heavier vehicles, but also the longer, larger vehicles. When does the temporary restriction end? Well, the, the signs are still up, so technically it's still in effect. So, I mean, we didn't put, put a specific time frame on it. I think what we had sort of said is we'd come back to you and just, you know, you could make a determination as to whether it's something you wanted to extend more, more permanently. So the only benefit of making it permanent is we may get a change to some of the GPS map applications that are probably directing people there, I would guess. Right, and, and again, it's temporary because it was associated with construction projects going on in the area. So we really, there's not a good basis for saying we, we need to continue this temporary restriction, particularly if it's on, on the basis of a truck length. Even with a sharp turn? Yeah, that's really what the county attorney's office advised us. So what's the difference between saying no semis and no trucks over 40? Is it 45 or 47 feet long? That's basically semi trucks, right? Yeah, I mean, Why is legally, that more defensible. That was based on reference to the state statute. Okay, I'd have to get an attorney over here to give you more, okay. you know, detailed advice. I'm in favor of doing it. Is that your recommendation that we make it permanent, or do you have opinion? Opinion? Again, I can see there is a basis for doing it. Again, I, I always have some reservations about putting 
a new restriction on a road because it's like doing any other kind of one-off thing. You have other people come in and say, well, I fall in the same category, you know, I'd like you to, to change that for me. But again, given the sort of the configuration and, you know, the heavy residential development along that roadway and, and the like, have you had any objection from trucking companies to the new, the temporary restrictions that were heard any name? I haven't heard anything. Comments? Not directly. Okay. I would support John's recommendation in that case. If you want to do it, we would come back to you probably with an ordinance. Okay. Yeah. During admin matters. And we would look to change the sign to make it much more visible and, you know, some sort of restrictive type sign the ones now are maybe not quite as visible and you know they've got a fair amount of wording on them mm -hmm. okay so you're going to ban what you recommend what these guys are supporting is banning all truck traffic on country club road um, semi -truck. all semi-truck traffic local exempting lo local, local deliveries. deliveries would be exempted and you'll and you'll you know again it's it's not going to take all trucks off that because you'll have those trucks that'll decide to drive it anyway or they they won't recognize it's a restriction and they'll get off they'll go they'll through it one time there and they won't be able to turn around um, yeah I, I think you know, if they get on that road they're probably going through you know end to end it may stop somebody who's a repeated user of that roadway from using it um you know the other thing we heard from the residents is there's lots of rv traffic on that road over the weekends and this doesn't do anything to change that although technically on a 45 foot length restriction you might have some even rv traffic that you know <laughs> and make it a private road let them main it, maintain it then if nobody can use it i mean the the problem is and you tried to say this but of course you speak engineer so nobody understands it when you when you displace the truck traffic i i mean i don't want truck traffic behind my house i come but like i said all not all morning the, all, all those damn semis are rolling right by, behind my house on a city street, in the middle of the city, not not out in the co county. And when you do this, you're going to displace that truck traffic. You're going to push it somewhere else. You're going to push those impacts onto some other neighborhood. So these guys have 30 trucks. It's 30 more trucks going to be on Douglas Road. Those people have their kids. Their kids go to school too, and you're just going to push it onto them. So that's fine. Let's move on. Okay. Squeaky wheel. Squeaky wheel. Oh boy, this keeps getting better. <laughs> and I was lamenting that I hadn't seen you in a while. Yeah, I know. Bring two hot items too. Thank you. Thank you for your due diligence. So this, <laughs> as you, you know, you're both very, or you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with uh, Cottonwood Subdivision. It's out in the port. Uh, for Commissioner Cavallos, I don't know how much you know about Cottonwood's, but. It's a subdivision that um, was constructed in largely in the 70s, platted in the 70s. It really kind of got in before all our, our floodplain regulations came into effect. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's, it's built in a very area. undesirable location. And yeah, all, almost, spots, but almost the entirety of the, flood, of the subdivision is in the floodplain. There is an irrigation diversion structure that exists. So the the diversion structure, yeah, you you got. Did you get an update on this? You got some correspondence. Okay. Oh, we did. So there's a diversion structure right here. This is shown in in more detail, and that diversion structure has been there uh, for many many years, predates the subdivision. And there, uh, the, the irrigation company is that needs to do some repairs to their <laughs> structure. Okay. The concrete is eroded over the years. Yeah. So um, basically we're dealing with, time, yeah, early 1900s. They did make some repairs in the 60s <laughs> and they put a concrete cap on it, but the concrete cap has now been damaged and it's eroded some. And um, again, they need to address that issue. So in 1997, there was a flood insurance study done and it shows a dam crest at an elevation sort of around 50, 77.3. There's some, because of some of the erosion of the cap, 
part of the weir crest was surveyed in at mm. 50 76.7 so yeah. you know six tenths of a foot lower so in 2006 fema came through and the state came through with what they called the map modernization project and so it was to change the vertical datum on all the floodplain maps and to try to um, get them into a gis depiction so you know put state planes and and make them so you could actually uh, more readily utilize the floodplain delineations in a digital form and when that was done we don't know why or how but the model was run with a crest elevation on the structure of 73.5 feet so about 3.8 feet and it's still the same datum yeah when you're when you're making a datum the datum correction or comparison it it shows 3.8 feet difference and lower because it was all put on NAVD 88 at that point in time and the but the 2015 and 2016 survey show the crest elevation at 77.3 so they these data from 2015 and 2016 match Who's the values. Who's they used the data? It's the irrigation district having it surveyed so that they could redo the hydraulic center. Who cares, though? Well. The federal government. It's not like they lowered the raised the concrete. It's the same high. It's the elevation it is. Well, what it, what it, the problem we have is the 20, 2006 model that exists out there now as the weir represented in the model 3.8 feet below what it should have been that's the well, big issue right so it's not. the it's an error yeah in the modeling that the irrigation district has to correct when they come through to do work in the floodplain to fix their structure well on a house or something like that a letter of map provision is pretty simple isn't it i mean you just get the low opening and you somebody submits it to you don't they and sign it and you guys process it or not yeah well this will come through as a letter of map revision so it won't be that's not complicated is it no I mean the, the process here is simple what okay. what I'm out to tell you about is the impacts to the property owners from a floodplain perspective that's the complication okay because when you go through and you take what's referred to as the effective model which was what was done in 2006 so go back one slide again let me see this one more time. Okay, so the study shows it lower than the so, field. So, no, the issue is. Okay, go ahead. Go 19, ahead. Keep going. Well, what happens is that the effective model we have, which is from 2006, mm -hmm. has the weir crest elevation too low. It's in error. It's off by over three feet. So what they modeled back then gave the weir three, more than three feet of vertical capacity that it doesn't have. So what it means is that we have a new range of water surface elevations or base flood elevations, BFEs, that have been calculated for this area. And it does cause some to, to be lowered but immediately in the vicinity of the drop structure, of the diversion structure, they're gonna go up. And some of them are gonna go up pretty dramatically. We've got increases of up to three feet upstream of that structure. Oh. And the most significant rises occur along McConnell Drive. In your buddy's house. <laughs> and this sort of gives a, a summary. There's 57 parcels that are gonna see a rise in base flood elevation 109 we'll see a reduction in base so, flood elevation so is every one of them going to have to then go through and do a letter of map revision as well they can uh, the letter of map revision will cover this entire reach okay but it, it will have implications for people in terms of potentially for their flood insurance rates or we have some properties that did um they did not letter of map revisions but they did letter of map rev adjustments or they did elevation certificates and they had shown that por portions of their property were out of the floodplain well which may not be the fact anymore nothing should be any different 
No, it's... No, I don't think so. Water can be three feet higher. No, it can't be. If the structure's three feet higher than what right. the study shows. No, no, it's not. They higher. did some kind of, they did some kind of, they flew it, right? Is that how they base their elevations? No, again, they've... Everything they've, relatively is the same elevation well, the difference. Ground, the ground elevations are potentially unchanged. No, they're not. There's no way, Mark. Okay, that's fine. They surveyed the top of the... Yeah, I, really? And it hits an obstruction. So if the obstruction is low, more water goes down and the floodplain's bigger downstream. Yeah, yeah. But and that's smaller the upstream. The, the, the obstruction is higher, so more water's going to back up behind. It's amazing it's to me. You know, what, you know what Steve Miller told me once? He said, this is the greatest job you're ever going to have in your life. You're going to walk in the door and all of a sudden your IQ is going to go up 10, 10 points to everybody who's ever talked <coughs> to you. Except apparently with you, county manager. Duh, I know this. I know what you're saying. But I'm just saying relatively, all of those, all of those elevations are, are relatively the same. If they, I'm, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there's no way they blew one shot and that's the top of the concrete. There's no way. Well, the, it's well, not, not like a, they didn't go out and do a field survey. They didn't go out and topo this. They flew it. No, the, the, the structure's been surveyed recently for the design. And what I'm saying is we don't know where the data got entered. You just have a different benchmark or something. You just, I mean, I'm I, a goddamn I, I, surveyor. I wish you were that. I'm telling you, man. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So in reality, everyone's flood insurance rates are going to go up. So it changes the But my way. guess is that in reality, no one's, no one's danger of flooding is going to change at all. Is well, it, is, because the houses have been there for 50 years. Is this the neighborhood that's just north of uh, Cash La Poudre, yeah. back in yeah. there? Yeah. Up toward, and, and during the 2013 flood, there was some flooding in some of those homes, was there not? Yeah, I mean, it, that, that neighborhood, when they, when they start to identify potential flooding on the Poudre, that's one of the first neighborhoods to start to see water we, come out of there. We sandbagged it. In what year did we sandbag it? We bought a sandbagger. Mm -hmm. Remember that? And that was, it was like 11, 2011 or something, or 10. We did. We and we let them use it. If, if we see high flows on, if it's a high flow year on the Pooter, oh, that's no one disputes. It's in the flood plain. No. Nobody disputes. No, that. Again, so so here again is a tab tabulation. We've got actually the floodway does change oh. to some people's advantage. Oh, so there are going to be some ad advantages to properties oh, that are in the floodway, and that some will come out. How does that um, happen? If the structure is higher than they thought, it seems like there's more water. How does some people come out of it when you know, it's it's, it's sort of the when all when, McConnell is upstream from the diversion structure? No, it lowered. So. It, it's in it's lowered, hasn't it? This, the 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 elevation of the structure has lowered. It's three feet higher than the study thought it. Was. Yeah, the structure is actually higher. The weir crest on the structure is almost three so three point eight feet higher. In in repairing the in repairing the diversion structure, if it's three feet higher. What are they going to do? They're going to. They're just going to put it back to what it was. What I'm saying is, it's. We're not going to change it. It's, it's won't work. three p. It's an error. Okay, there's an error in the model, and when they modeled it back in 2006, they said the top of the structure was actually more than three feet below where it actually is. So now, when they correct it to represent it where it is and where they're going to put it back to, that changes. The floodplain mapping up, so they, particularly they upstream. Lower, the diversion structure? No. They're not going to do anything to the diversion They're structure. Rebuild just exactly the way just it build is. it exactly the same way. Because the, the irrigation ditch won't be able to be served if they lower it. I'm right. It's based on a, a level that was too low, lower than the actual value. In the model. And so what apparently they, they have agreed to do is they are going to use the low. So they had two elevations in there that were six tenths apart. Lower, They're going to yeah. use the lower elevation. So they're not going to. Elevate it all the way across. But how does anybody come out if there's more water? When you when you do floodway modeling, it's based on equal conveyance reductions, and it's based on sort of the model just comes in and defines a limit where you don't cause any more than a half foot rise. So it's it's sort of a numerical, artificial. I mean, it's a process. There aren't really physical. There's no through physical basis. It's like taking a glass wall and, and moving it in to see when you start to see a half foot rise. And that defines the floodway, which is the area you're supposed to keep free of obstruction because it's you know used most heavily for conveyance. 
The other thing they did is when, when they did the modeling previously. Why people don't like engineers, by the way. Okay, I'm just telling you. Okay. Well, a big part of it is when they when they did the modeling previously, they just, there's something called Manning's and it's a roughness value. It describes how uh, sort of friction resistance to flow on the surface. So they just put in high Manning's end values for all the all the homes. This time around, they actually coded in the obstructions to flow represented by the homes. So it's a slightly different approach to how they model it. More accurate, it. is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, it doesn't just sort of lump everything okay. into one resistance value. And, and that had a change in terms of then floodplain and floodway limits. Well, so for 44 people, it's good news. And for over 100 people, it's no news at all. And for six people, it's bad news. Yeah, this, yeah. this will oh, yeah. make it uh, clear as well. So what, what is our role in all of this? Well, normally our, our role would just be to, it goes before the flood review board. And from a, fle from a floodplain administration standpoint, flood review board reviews it. If they accept or in concurrence agree with the analyses that are done, it would then go on to FEMA and do, you know, there'd be a letter of map revision. All the property owners would get notified as part of the letter of map revision process. And then, you know, once FEMA's reviewed and commented on it, there's a 90 day comment period that the public has to respond to FEMA. We're coming to talk to you because this has been such a, you know, an area of, of major concern to all the residents in the past. And, and it does represent some fairly significant changes. So we're kind of looking at, you know, how do we best inform everybody? Again, it's not, it's not due to something we're doing as a county, but mm -hmm. there are citizens again, so. Because we really don't have any say in it, do we? I mean, the flood review Not board really, it's, it's, and, and I don't think the flood review board is gonna find, you know, any real deficiencies with the modeling. The residents certainly have the opportunity through the FEMA process to hire their own engineer and look at it or contest it. So do those, um, pe those people who's, whose values are gonna go up, they can't, do they have the opportunity to do a, a map provision letter as well? I mean, you always have the, the opportunity to hire your own expert or to look at, at floodplains. What I'm saying is the work that the irrigation district is doing covers this whole reach. And so, you know, it's a fairly extensive technical analysis. I um, can't see the contours. I mean, I know there's a the tunnel lines on here. There's constri there's a cross sections used in the model and there's base flood elevations and the, the blue and the black ones are the differences in elevation contours. The most significant changes are occurring kind of in this area here. What are the properties that come out? Can you point those out? So nobody technically comes out of the floodplain. You can see the floodplain limits mm -hmm. up here on the top don't really change. Oh, I see corrected regulatory floodway. Okay. Floodway, so one floodway is here. Yeah. The existing one is up here. The new one dips down here. Okay. That's the new floodplain. So you have floodway. 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 So you've got floodway. all these properties Come out. in this area okay. are no longer in the floodway. They're still in the floodplain. Okay. And that's a result of a change in the modeling techniques, not the correction of the height of the structure. Correct. Got it. So our role is basically to inform people, explain the process, just let them know, facilitate their comments or whatever. Yeah, so you're gonna have potential insurance rate increases. You may have people that have done letter map amendments and have removed part of their property and if the elevation comes up enough, it's gonna affect that. Um, but then on the other side, those properties that benefits benefit from it may see reductions in insurance rate if the depth of flooding on their property changes enough to make a difference. So what's the best way to, to communicate all this to the people there? So that, that's part of the question. So this is scheduled to go to the flood review board on October 24th. Yeah. And we would notify people. I mean, there's a public notice in the newspaper that goes, has to go out two weeks ahead of that on the 10th. Uh, we, I think, would propose that we ought to send out letter notifications before it ever goes to flood review board. That would Should be one option. Meeting out there in the neighborhood, an open house. Uh, that's, uh, why wouldn't the Why wouldn't the ditch company do that? Well, I don't know. Somebody should. It seems well, the ditch good. company is just, from their perspective, they're just dealing with a map correction, 
and they're gonna you know put in there. It's not gonna do it. So it seems like that would be a be you're gonna it'd be a better chance for you. It could be a full it. open house, or it, it, the only challenge with the open house is we'll be there trying to represent the work that's being done because I don't think the irrigation company or its engineer mm -hmm. are necessarily. Yeah. But if you don't do that, attend. you're going to have a bunch of people at your flood review board meeting, and then you're going to spend an hour right. or two educating them. It'll make your meeting better at the. Or we could do sort of an informal drop in kind of thing. So, can you go yeah. back two slides? And I would, if we send them a letter, I would be giving them reference to the technical report, making it available on our website as well. I don't know. Hmm. Want to come to the public meeting. So, point out that, point out the weir. So the weirs. Right in here. Okay, zoom in a little, can you? <coughs> we did before. Can you zoom in? Mm hmm And so, there's your, s so the, the elevation of the weir is 77 and a half or something, 78, nearly 78. So, who got added? Where's the place where they got added? That's a good question. Well, water surface elevations in this area went up two to three feet. No, oh, sorry, I don't have a pointer on. So the floodway boundary doesn't look like it changed very much. Two to three the foot. Flood plain, I'm sorry. Doesn't look like it changed very the much. The height went up two to three as far feet as the right there. Of parcels, yeah. Based on the modeling. Yep. Okay. I don't see what parcels would have got added. Again, it's not necessarily parcels added to the floodplain. It's parcels that see increased water surface elevations on their parcel. Okay. But of course, the, the thing that's so foolish about this okay. is if you go back in where the weir is, if you zoom right in there at the weir, if the weir was really four feet higher, I mean, look at those blue contour lines. Go back one, two, three, four. I mean, it would be as high as the, I mean, way back in the middle of your screen. It would be that high based on your modeling if it was actually, if it was actually four feet higher than the modeling showed. It's all relatively. Well, it's all relative as far as its base heights. Unless the unless the lots were correct, but the weir was wrong. So so the weir, if, and what's in the main channel is only a portion of the flow here. There's a lot of the water. Four feet higher. One, two, three, four. It would be as high as that. It was really four feet higher than, than the model than, than what we thought it was. That's four feet. That's four contours. That's four feet. Uh, those aren't all one foot yeah, apart. Some of them are. They sure are. It looks off you to the right. Check on that. Off to the right, it looks like it. 50, yeah, 72, you can 50, 73. You can see it. I looked at it too. I'm pretty sure. Okay, you know, I mean, this is three. So it would be, okay, so this would be, I don't know what four is. Four would be right here. It would be four feet. Hmm. I mean, and it's obviously not that high. It didn't, you know, what I mean. It's all relatively the same elevation, which is why it doesn't seem like it should be different. But that's fine. I guess it's a big deal. Essentially what's happening is less water is being conveyed in the main channel. More gets dis distributed out in the floodplain, the overbank or overflow areas, which causes more water to be flowing out there. And that's you fine. still have sort of an overtopping condition. At so, one point the neighbors talked about the county building some kind of a drainage structure that would bypass the, you remember that discussion? Yeah, I mean, we actually made application to the state to try to get funding to see if there were any flood, you know, control mitigating yeah, options I that think we, could, a, a we could do out here. Up north or something up past upstream. I, I should yeah, say I mean, the county would have built it. I think you looked into some options of alternatives that I think you said the neighborhood would have to to do some protections of their neighborhood. Is that? Do I, am I remembering correctly the discussion? Well, you'd, you'd almost have to be looking at a levee situation, and levees are probably, again, somewhat limited, limiting right. by this subdivision encroaches so close to the river yeah. and cuts off so much of, I mean, so much of the flow is actually going yeah. through the neighborhood. I thought somebody said at one point that there was consideration given by someone of some kind of a drainage structure under one of those streets off to the east that would go off to the east. Am I remembering that? Well, correctly? that was so. If you remember, we were out there for a meeting one time. So yeah, I'm so using up house. way more than my allotted time here. Mm -hmm. There's a little drainage pond back in this uh -huh. area, I believe, and they were talking about just way a low flow way to take flow out of the under the street yes. into the irrigation canal. 
I mean, that's something that's just only going to work for small events. Yeah, it's going to get overwhelmed easily. That was just a, lo okay. a real local dream. I just couldn't remember. All right, so what are you proposing? What do you suggest for inform information? I guess I am suggesting we need to get the information out to people. That seems smart. Ahead of time, wanting want to make you aware of it so that you know it's in process. We have received the application. And then if you believe it's warranted, we can go try to have an open house or or we could, you know, say, hey, we're available at these times. You want to drop in and, you know, we've got the information. We can try to go through it with you in more detail. I mean, an open house setting is sometimes a little more problematic if you're out to talk to somebody about the details and their individual yeah. you know, drop-ins probably better. Who you said an application has been received, who made the application to us? The irrigation. Okay. District made the application. And their application is for the work on their it's the It's to do the letter of map revision that applies to restoration of their structure. And if they're making it the same, why would they be required to come to the county for a letter of map revision? Because they're correcting an error in the current so they're having to correct some maps. Who, so who made the error? The 2006 study was done, was funded by the Department of Water Resources and FEMA, and Ayers Associates is the one who did the modeling. So the, the irrigation company has to make application to correct the federal government's error. They are. Because they're doing work and they have to use the, the correct... Yeah, they, just, they, they basically have to rerun the model to show no, inc no rise or no That's change. That's how the error was discovered? Right. Okay. So for your consideration, as another way to get the information out, I have my Laporte community conversation scheduled for uh, Saturday, October 12th. Uh, we can talk about whether or not that's a good idea, uh, but that might be another opportunity. It would be from 8.30 to 10 mark on Saturday, October 12th. Commissioner, that might be a great way to even advertise that we could have some appointments set up for people to come in and discuss their own properties. Yeah, I think you're right. Probably the drop-in thing is probably better because people are going to want to talk about their property. They're not going to sit and want to hear a bunch of other people until they can get heard. You do this more than I do. But I think you'd be better off doing some kind of proactive notification. Yeah. Your, your meeting on the 24th will go much better, I think. Or it won't be as bad, I should say. So if we think the 12th might be helpful, we should work out mm -hmm. the logistics of that because the current venue might not accommodate all the people Let's do another study maybe who might show up. Down. Or if you wanted to do appointments, I'm not clear how you would do that. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay. So back to me. Uh, and. We had another item on the agenda uh, for an update on the State Historical Fund Grant. Pam Marcus Bowsey was here last week. Um, and as it turns out, we heard from the City of Fort Collins on Friday that they have decided to postpone submitting this application until the next grant cycle, which is April or so, and so that they can address some questions, some of the questions that you asked, and I think there were some other questions that came up. Um, so they think they can probably do a better submittal if they wait um, and answer those questions then. So that's an easy one. Um, do you have any other questions about that? Okay. And then as far as other director updates, um, wanted to let you know that uh, you will be seeing uh, Randy Pope on October 14th with a request, a one-time request to exceed his um, cap on his um, planning approval for um, to host that memorial. So that will be coming back to you. Um, and we had some communication back and forth last week about that, and we can meet the noticing requirements if we do it on the 14th. So just wanted you to be aware that um, we've been working on that, and that's how we closed the loop on that particular que question. How do, you, how do you word that? It's not an amended special review condition, is it? It's not amending the conditions, or how does, how does um, that mean? We, we met with the attorneys just to make sure that we could follow a process and procedure that makes sense. and. Um, uh, they recommended that we basically word it as a request to um, deviate a, sort of a one-time uh, exception to go um, out above the cap that was placed as part of the special 
um, as part of their special review approval. Um, so we'll work with them to make sure that we word that appropriately for this purpose. So there really isn't a procedure outlined in the code. That you there have, I believe, there right? isn't. So um, you charged a fee for that hearing. We we are charging a fee um, somewhere in the order of I think it's about thirteen hundred dollars. I understand he may be requesting to appeal that as well. So that would be part of the package potentially. Of course. Yeah. Um, and how are the neighbors notified of that hearing? And what is the notification distance? So it would be our standard notification procedure. So fi within 500 feet of the application, um, we'll notify neighbors as soon as we have the application materials complete, which I believe he came in this morning and submitted everything that he needed to submit. So that should be going out in the next couple of days. Okay. So, um, and then today you have a fairly straightforward agenda. It looks like five consent items. Um, we're not expecting anything out of the ordinary, to my knowledge. Um, you don't have evening hearing, obviously. Next week, you'll be in Estes in the evening on Monday. And um, my understanding is they're providing dinner upstairs before the hearing that starts at 530. So um, if you can make your way up the hill and be there at 5, then they'll have some food. For you, <laughs> um, I'll we'll send the final agenda and the packet materials you've in essence already seen because those were the letters that went back and forth and the two options around the IGA. Um, you'll see the final agenda this week. Um, there's one additional item that um, I believe you've seen before also, but there was a resolution that the planning commission had put forward that will be part of the discussion that evening as well. So um, so that's what to expect next week. Um, and that's all I had for you as far as updates this week. Unless Great. You have something. No? Okay. Anything else, Lori? No, sir. Great. Just that it's on my Which meeting? Oh, on well, mind. you wouldn't want to miss that. No. Maybe we could get so lucky to have it not be on our calendars. That is on there. Uh, just thank you to uh, our county engineer and his team, as well as our community development folks. Thank you. We'd like to be okay. thanked. Great. Board adjourned. Mm -hmm. See you guys in 35 minutes.